Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. Before we dive in fully on today's topic, I want to give you a list of signs that it's time to consider a move to assisted living or a memory community. Few seniors want to leave or give up their home, but as we've discussed in the two previous episodes, safety is our priority and sometimes that means leaving the family home. How do you know when it's the right time to consider this move? Timing the transition to senior housing is tough because it's very personal and it depends greatly on how well your loved one is handling living in their home, their health status, and their future care needs. The following questions will help you determine if an aging loved one should consider moving into a senior community. I've put a link to these questions on the show notes, so don't worry about taking notes or remembering because we know we got better things to do than that. Before I list the questions, let's take just a second for our sponsor. Sponsors make it possible for me to bring this podcast to you free every week, so please give the sponsor tag a listen. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbk seniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400. Is the senior eating healthy, balanced meals regularly? Is there fresh, nutritious food in their kitchen? How are they getting and fixing their food? Are they relying solely on family to bring it to them? Is the senior capable of getting around safely? Look for unexplained bruises or minor injuries that may indicate that they have been falling or having accidents. Are they wearing fresh, clean clothing each time you visit? Can they and do they bathe themselves regularly and are they able to handle washing their towels, clothes, and linens? Is their home and a yard as neat and well cared for as it used to be? Is the senior remembering to take their medications correctly? with the right dosage, at the right time. Warning signs include hospitalizations, stockpiled or expired medications, and pill boxes that are not current. Are they able to operate household appliances safely? Do they remember to turn off the kitchen appliances when they are finished cooking? Is their home equipped with safety features and modifications for aging in place, such as grab bars and an emergency response system? We discussed that in detail in last week's episode. Do they have a plan in place to summon help in a case of an emergency? Are they still driving safely? Red flags include an increase in accidents, new dents or scratches on their car. Are they no longer driving? Do they have an alternate means of transportation? This alternate transportation should not be neighbors and family 100% of the time. Are they paying their bills on time and opening and handling mail in a timely manner? Look for stacks of mail, unpaid bills, and definitely past due notices. Do they have friends, family, or acquaintances with whom they interact regularly? Do the seniors engage in any hobbies or activities that they enjoy, or have they given those up? One sign that things were changing with my dad was he gave up being a Rotarian, something he took great pride in, and had done for 45 years. His excuse was everything he wanted to do, he'd done. The cost was getting a little high. But now that I look back on it, I think he was withdrawing, and that was a definite red flag. When you really look at this person, are they still active and vibrant like they were years ago? 
Or do you see a more limited person who needs added help around the house and with their personal care needs? They may appear more nervous or reluctant to do their usual things. If the answer to most of these questions is no, or you are noticing some of the red flags I mentioned, then it may be time to research local assisted living communities. Requesting a needs assessment through your local area aging agency on aging, I'm not sure I've ever said that correctly, will help you determine if your loved one is a good fit for assisted living or if a lower level of care like independent living is an option or do they need a higher level of care like memory community. Making the decision to move to a, a senior into a new living situation is difficult, but transitions are usually smoother when they happen sooner rather than later. I've had countless people tell me they wish they had done it all sooner, the move, and they, that's their one piece of advice. Do it sooner rather than later. After an initial adjustment period, many seniors find that they truly appreciate the higher level of support as well as the added opportunities for socialization, dining, and activities. Lastly, a plan of care in place eases the pressure on family members who are providing ongoing hands-on care. Unfortunately, there is often a bigger question to consider when you realize that your loved one can no longer stay in their own home. How do we pay for a senior community? Today, many elderly Americans who cannot afford the ongoing cost of home care Assisted living or nursing home care are faced with the decision of whether or not to use their home as a source of funding to pay for that care. Since many seniors have significant equity in their homes and knowing that Medicare does not pay for assisted living or personal care at home, using the home to finance long-term care can be a good option and sometimes it's the only option. So on today's episode, as promised, I bring in a different family member who has helped many seniors navigate their retirement years, helped my family after dad died, and also happens to deal with Alzheimer's on a near daily basis. Let me introduce you to my hubby, John. John is a realtor and property manager, and he's here today to discuss with us what to do with the family home when your loved one can no longer live on their own. Much of this information will also apply to what to do with the family home after our loved ones are no longer with us. So say hello. Hello, everybody. And tell us, how long have you been a real estate agent? Uh, I've been a real estate uh, agent and property manager for 14 years now. 14 years. That's a long time. You, so you've, you've got a little bit of experience, huh, there? Just a little. Okay. So my research shows that there are four options available to us. They are renting out the home, selling the home, getting a reverse mortgage, and getting a home equity line of credit. However, not each of these options is available to all homeowners depending on their family situation and location in which they will receive care. And I've included a table on the show notes that describes the different types of family situations and the options available to them. So let's start with eight things to do with the house when a loved one's died or moved out. So first there's selling. So what do we need to do to get the house ready to sell? Well, one of the things that's really important when you're getting ready to sell your home is to make sure it looks like it's livable. And that means make sure that it's clear of any clutter, uh, that it's clean. Um, If there's an opportunity to update the property in any way, so if it's really dated and it has older appliances or it has older fixtures, You want to highlight things such as decorating that take away from some of the dated items in the house. So this way you're not spending money to update things unless you actually have to. Um, You're trying very hard to be as neutral as possible looking for the average buyer when they come through the house. That makes sense. And I've seen suggestions things like make sure you change the locks make sure you secure the property and this one is actually one thing my sister and I did that I haven't discussed was uh, searching for valuables we never did find my dad's wedding ring I don't know where it went between hospitals and home on hospice so I also linked an article on the show notes that 
it talks about what to do after somebody's died, but I think it also applies to if your family member with memory loss has to move out. Obviously, they can't tell you where they've stashed all the good stuff. So... I think, I think one of the things that's important to do, especially if there's a lot of items in the house and there are other siblings or other relatives that are a part of the family, is to do an inventory and to go through each of the rooms in the house. And when you find an item, just jot it down. Even make a, just a voice recording on your phone. Found wedding, wedding ring with a number of stones. Found picture of... Uh, family members from 30 years ago. And then this way you have not only a record of the items for any insurance purposes, but this way all of the family members know what's there. And it makes it easier if you're going to be giving those items to other family members, it makes it easier for them to know where things went, especially afterwards. Because, you know, if a loved one passes away and you give an item that's a family heirloom to another relative and then that relative passes away, you know that person has that and then that way that item could come back into the family to another sibling or another relative. Okay, and I want to point out something. That that exact advice was given two episodes ago in the decluttering section of this three-part series. So you've heard it twice. That means it's something you guys got to do. So... Give us some scenarios for good reasons to keep the house after moving to senior care. That's what we did with my parents' home. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we were probably contemplating selling it. Mm -hmm. And then we had a Rotarian CPA friend suggest that we keep it, which is what we did. So kind of walk everybody through that process, how we kind of flipped the idea I mean, that was such an emotional time. I'm lucky if I remember it. It was. It's important that each person's or each family's circumstances are going to be different. Um, I would say in our case, we were fortunate that your father did very well financially as far as retirement and and, and anticipating care for mom for a number of years after, after his passing. Um, not every family is going to be in our situation. So there's a couple of different avenues to think about. Um, as far as our circumstances were, uh, mom and dad's house was paid for, um, and they had owned it for many years. So it was under proposition 13. So it was under very low taxes. So we had a better option and our Rotarian friend did tell us that it was a really good option to rent the house out because that way we had a continuous income stream in order to take care of mom, um, and it didn't burden the accounts in the, in the, in the retirement as much. So it gave us the option to care for mom longer term. And again, not everyone's going to have this, this, these circumstances, but the way the market is right now, uh, rents are high, uh, property values are high. So, it was a good option for us to supplement, you know, almost 50% of mom's care, um, just through the rental. Now, the situation can change because if the market does decrease and values decrease, then, you know, rents may go down and then we have to reevaluate. And and what every person should do in the situation where they are renting a house is once a year take an inventory of where the finances are, what rents are doing, how's your tenant been in the property, have they paid on time, have they taken good care of the house, and do that inventory once a year just to make sure that you're on track because, Two, three, four years from now, we may find that, you know, the rents may not be where they are. We may not be getting the income. Mom's care may be more expensive. And at that point, we may need to reevaluate whether or not we're going to need to sell the house um, in order to uh, to take care of mom. So, again, it's not not every person is going to be able to be in that situation. Um, mm-hmm. If If you're in a situation, even if you have a mortgage on the property... If you can rent the property and still have a positive income from the rental that will help with the expenses, then you definitely want to consider it. So, you know, you you do you have situations where uh, that that even with a mortgage still on the property, you you can still do that option of renting it out as long as you know what you're doing and you have a qualified property management company that can take care of it. Because here's the thing about that, and this is something that's really important. If you have other members of 
family that are involved with the property, it's best to have a property manager because they're a neutral third party. You don't have a situation where you have one sibling that's managing the house and then two or three other siblings keep asking that one sibling, well, how's this going and are they paying the rent on time and are they doing this? Are you keeping an accounting of the monies? It's best to have that neutral third person involved so then that way nobody can quibble over the expenses. And it makes it easier at tax time because remember – even though mom or dad might be in assisted living, they still have to pay taxes. The government still wants to get paid. <laughs> Always. Always. So So I have two questions. Go ahead. One, you made the comment that rents are high and property values are high. Is that a fairly accurate statement nationwide? It is fairly accurate for large metropolitan areas. New York, California, Los Angeles, Dallas, Texas, um, Large metropolitan areas are seeing very high rents, very high values. Um, so you're in a situation where um, you have these, you know, these situate these scenarios that we're dealing with here in California. I, California is the exception, though, because ours is the highest in the country. Um, not and again, this is this is just I'm trying to be as general as I possibly can, but you know, larger metropolitan areas are going to see these higher rents and higher values. Okay, so you've got mom, we moved her into the memory community, now it's like, as I recall, it was like, holy crap, what do we do with this house? How do you go about finding out, you know, can you, should you rent it for longer term care? Is that an option? And how do you go about maybe finding a good agent, property manager that can honestly help you with that? Because obviously it wasn't hard for us to find one. Well, this is true. Um, but if you're in that situation, I think what's important is is that you ask your friends and your family. Um, most, someone knows a man, property manager or realtor and they've done uh, a really good job for a family member or a friend. That's usually the best way to find somebody is through recommendations or reviews. Um, you want someone that has had experience with dealing with people with assisted living, geriatric parents, you know, you want to have someone that is very familiar with the ins and outs of dealing with the various legal ramifications, financial ramifications. So someone that's done that, um, like in my example, of course, you know, we have mom and dad, but we also, or I also have a number of clients in our senior communities that live around us. Um, that's our active adult or over 55. And I've, you know, been experienced in dealing with people where they've lived in a house for 30, 40, 50 years, and now they've decided to downsize and their kids want them to move closer. And it seems that's that's the thing I've been doing for the last couple of years. So again, you, you want to ask those questions uh, of the professional that you're going to hire. Have you dealt with these circumstances? And if they don't answer the question that makes you feel comfortable, then they're not going to be a good fit. Yeah, because it's definitely... It's a definite, definitely different scenario from I have this as an investment property and it's just a business. This is still the home that my sister and I grew up in. It's very emotional. Yeah, there's it a can lot be. of emotion involved. And there's obviously mom's care to consider. It's not just an investment for us or the extended family. So I, I agree with that. And I've I've been witness to your other clients who are dealing with pretty much the same scenario and, you know, it's, it's definitely different. So I totally agree with that somebody needs to have experience with dealing with this particular situation. I think one of the things too, to point out is this whole situation is a partnership. It's a partnership with the family, with your real estate professional, and in some circumstances, well, financial planner, if there's a financial planner involved, and also the assisted living facility where mom or dad is going to be going. Um, all of those things have to work together in order for you to be successful. And, you know, even though the real estate part of it is is just one part of it, that person or that individual needs to be able to work with all the others in order to be successful in the care for our loved ones. Okay, so if you have an older parent, you don't expect them to be around as long as perhaps mom will be. Or you just can't agree on renting out the place or that's not, you have debt on the house that doesn't make the numbers work for renting. 
the, obviously the next step would be to sell it, yes? Mm-hmm, correct. Okay. So in that scenario, if you're going to be selling the property, what you want to do is a couple of different things. Um, if, uh, if the uh, person's lived in the house for many, many years, um, what you want to do, first of all, is you want to get an appraisal on the property. Uh, and what that does is it helps with the understanding of what the tax ramifications are going to be if uh, the person's lived there for many years. So um, that way you avoid any tax issues. So you want to get an appraised value of the property of what it's worth. And then what you need to do is you need to think about, okay, if we're going to sell the house, um, you know, what's the cost going to be to sell it? And any real estate professional can give you the indication of, you know, what the fees are going to be, what the commissions are going to be. And then the last thing you need to do is you need to talk to find a, a definitely consult a CPA or a financial planner if you don't already have one and learn what are the tax ramifications going to be if we sell the property. Um, another thing that kind of comes into play as well is if you're going to sell the house and the person's on Medi-Cal or Medicare, um, selling the house because it's an asset could adjust or change their benefits. So that's why it's important that whichever financial planner that you pick to help you with this is familiar with uh, Medicare and Medicaid and what those ramifications are going to be if you sell the house. Because it, if it's an asset that's going to make you look more wealthier than you actually are, it could change your, your benefit structure. So that's, again, why you want to bring in a professional if you sell the house. My head is spinning again. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to it. <laughs> there is a lot to it. And this is why planning ahead is so yes. very, very important. Yeah. You guys don't want to live through what we lived through with you know, dealing with a parent on hospice and their death and moving a parent to a memory community, cleaning out the house, figuring out what the heck to do with the house. Whoo! <laughs> and I think one of the things that was really good for us, and this is something that I, I, I tell my clients over and over and over again, is um, uh, dad left us a binder. And in that binder, it had information on the financial planners and where the insurance companies were. And of course, the most important thing, username and passwords for accounts, online accounts. He didn't leave that part. Well, he, well it, it, some of them, we had some of them. Some of them were very outdated because he hadn't updated them in quite some time. But that's something you should be doing. If you have an older parent, you should be sitting down with them once a year and saying, hey, mom, dad, you know, what accounts do you have out there? Um, you know, what is it that you have uh, that we might need to know about if something happens to you? Because there's a lot of access to information that's now done through the Internet where it used to be done on paper. So if you don't have the right username, passwords, and all that other stuff, it makes it a lot more difficult for you to find the information. Or impossible. Uh, or impossible. We um, just tried canceling his cell phone, and that was a challenge because we didn't have his personal information and PIN and yeah. all that. That was a pain in the butt. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we also had situations where, and, you know, he's he's been gone for well over a year. We're still getting mail. We're still, there's still accounts popping up that we didn't know about that we're having to deal with. So it's good to have an inventory ahead of time, um, especially when it comes to the house, um, uh, to have all that information handy. Um, here's a, a funny one, and I this uh, comes from a story. I have a friend of ours, or a mutual friend of ours, whose father passed away a number of years ago, and he had a Facebook account. <laughs> and because his wife didn't have his username and password, his Facebook account is still out there, and God love him. Every once in a while, he still pops up out there uh, for various reasons, and I and I chuckle because our friend, um, who this is his father, he says it's kind of like Dad saying hello to him from the great beyond every once in a while. But you know, again, that's something you know. I, a lot of people think that when this is all, it's all about selling the house. It's it's a bigger picture than that. Um, obviously, and I know you've you've talked to the to the person that does the organizing stuff, but I think this is just it's the whole picture. Uh, the real estate portion is the biggest part of it. Um, now, when you uh, the uh, there were other two two others, reverse mortgage and um, 
home and home equity line. I would say probably the home equity line would be the last line of resort or last line of uh, use of funds financing because it costs money. It's money you're getting, but it's costing you money. Um, reverse mortgage is really good because um, there's really no there's really no detail. There's really no hitch to. Um, how it works, it's very straightforward. Um, and I know that you have an expert on that that's going to yes. be talking to you with that. Yes. So that you'll was, go in more details on that one. Yes, because it's there are three critical factors that must be taken into account. So you can't just say, well, in this situation, a reverse mortgage is probably a good idea. In this situation, it's probably not. There, It's a very personal set of factors so you would definitely have to talk to a ver- right reverse mortgage, mortgage specialist. specialist so okay we've talked about renting out and selling cleaning out organizing this is the end of three episodes on what the heck to do with the family home uh nobody liked my idea of just rolling a bomb through my parents house no that would have not been good <laughs> <laughs> there are days i still would like to do that because there was a lot of work to get it ready for the tenants and Sometimes that work creeps up and rears its ugly head and we have to deal with more little maintenance well, and issues. Well, it, and it's like anything else, you know, as houses age, it's just like people. They need more attention and, and That's a good scenario. you know, good sometimes, sometimes they need a facelift and, you know, instead of calling a plastic surgeon, we call a contractor and, you know, so, I mean, it, it, it just goes with saying, I mean, you know, and, and again, we were lucky that dad did take care of a lot of stuff but there was a lot of stuff that he didn't. So it's just important to ver- to make sure that you're in constant, not constant, but that you check in with your loved ones before this happens and make sure that, you know, things around the house are taken care of or, you know, maintenance that needs to be done. If you notice something that's broken in the house or whatever, say, hey, mom, dad, have you thought about getting this fixed or going and taking care of it? Because it'll save you a tremendous amount of headaches down the road. Because a lot of people don't, in, in my business, a lot of people, when when I get the house, I'm, I'm kind of at the end of the process. And a lot of times I think to myself, if only the family members three, four, five, ten years ago had taken care of certain things, they, one, wouldn't be dealing with the problems they're dealing with now, or they could have made significantly more money on the sale of the property and that much more funds to take care of mom or dad or your loved one, um, you know, going down the road. So I know it's planning, planning, planning. A lot of people don't like planning, especially when it comes to the thought of, you know, a loved one being, you know, having to be taken care of full time or passing away. And we don't like to think about that. I don't think we're geared that way. Um, but, you know, when you hear about it from people like us who are now on the other side of it, I think we're now taking that step to make sure that people out there don't have to go through what we're going or what we went through. Yes, that's, that's one of the one of the reasons for the podcast is to pass on the knowledge that we've learned the hard way because the school of hard knocks is not fun to attend. Um, you know, and it, the, the challenge with planning and is those difficult conversations you have to have with your family, with your parents and probably siblings and nobody likes difficult conversations. So one of the things I'm going to do is try to find somebody that can help us navigate these difficult conversations. And hopefully we can make an episode about that because I think that hurdle, getting past that, getting past the inability to have the difficult conversations might save a lot of difficult and trauma and frustration Mm -hmm. later on down the road. So be watching for that or listening, I guess, as the case may be. So, any last stories or wisdoms before we let these people run screaming into the street with all these things we keep telling them they have to do <laughs> on top of all the other things they have to do? Um, I would probably say the the bit of wisdom that you can pass that we could pass on is when you're in the middle of all of this, you think, "How am I going to survive all of this? How am I going to get everything done?" And you do get to the other side, and you do get through it. Um, 
your family, your friends are your greatest support and they will be there for you and be willing to accept their help. Definitely. I think that's probably one of the things that a lot of us think that we can handle it on our own. And I think the most important thing I, it per, I personally have learned out of all of this is don't be afraid to ask for help from other people because they may know more. They, there may be experts out there that it can help us and don't try and do it all by yourself. Um, I think that's probably the greatest thing that we learned out of this whole process is um, all of the people that we had that helped us through the process. So I think that's probably the best piece of wisdom that I could pass on. Yeah, and I'll second that. And there are other, if you don't have like a Rotary Club of 80 members like we do or some other service organization, if you're not involved in a large organization like we are, there are other Places to look support for help. groups and stuff. Yeah. Yes, there are definitely support groups. The Alzheimer's Association's website has tons of great information. So does a place for mom dot com. They have a whole blog that's got. I think they've got probably some of the best information. And definitely neighbors, friends, distant family don't don't hesitate to ask for help cleaning and, out the house. And one other thing uh-huh. I want to add to that is is that if you don't know a real estate professional and you like I said you ask friends and family, but the other thing you also can do and this is something I forgot to mention is seek out your local real estate association or your state real estate association um, because they have tons of resources especially for seniors and dealing with circumstances when it comes to real estate questions and so on. Um, they're valuable organizations in our local area. Um, here where we are, with it, we have the Delta Association of Realtors, Realtors, we have the California Association of Realtors, and they have a wealth of knowledge um, that you can tap into when with dealing with seniors and laws and regulations and, and so on and so forth. Definitely. Yep. So consult all your organizations and, and associations because... They've already learned it, done it, put it out there for us. So don't don't recreate the wheel. And I hope this was very helpful in help, helping you to understand that you need to plan what to do when you get in the situation like we were in. Hopefully you get to plan beforehand, unlike us. And I will be back with you guys again next week. And thank you, John. Hopefully we'll get to have other family members on Absolutely. as the season goes on. Thank you so much. Oh, but wait, I'm not done with you guys yet. First, we have to have our reverse mortgage expert give us a bit of information. So let me introduce Cynthia Ulrichson. She is a local mortgage specialist and a Rotarian and a really great friend. She came over at the last minute to provide this information when I realized that it was absolutely vital to this episode. So let's welcome Cynthia and listen in on our conversation. So, so that's recording. It should be. Oh I'll double gosh. check in a few minutes. <laughs> that way we don't have to redo this. <laughs> That'd be good. So tell me the basics on, on a reverse mortgage. Like, when is a good time to get one? What's good? You know, well, I, have, I know nothing. Okay. So, so a reverse in. mortgage, the homeowner has to be 62 or older. Okay. Okay. And then the amount of equity that's in the property, whether they own a have a loan that they owe on or they owe in it free and clear. So if they own it free and clear, then they would automatically qualify for a reverse mortgage at the age of 62. But because of how young they are, the amount of accessible equity is going to be less. That makes sense. Than if they were 72 or 82. Okay. So when you start to get older, the more equity that's available via a line of credit. And you can take it as all cash, or but what most people do is they set up what's called the, an actual line of credit against their home, but when they draw on it for whatever use, payment. On the house. Right, there's no house payment on that line of credit that they borrow. Now let's say someone's 70 years old and they owe $150,000 on their current regular mortgage, and the house is worth 500000 Well, what a reverse mortgage program does is it calculates the model based on age, value, and what equity is left to be used. So there isn't really an exact answer, say, you know, 
40% equity, 50% equity, it's all a factoring. It's a moving factor based right. on age at the time you take out the, Makes sense. the reverse mortgage. And so what happens after they die, the family pays back the reverse? No. So, well, they can, but let's say, um, well, two examples, okay? So if at the time of the, the last owner's passing, so if it's um, husband and wife that purchase, um, it's the last surviving spouse. At that time, depending on what their reverse mortgage balance has grown to, if the market value of the home is greater than that balance, they would simply handle it just like if they had a regular mortgage. They would list it for sale, it would get sold, that reverse mortgage is paid off, the remaining funds are theirs. If there is a situation where the balance has grown beyond what the current market value is, which let's say we were in a downturn and we had a, a decrease in values, that could happen, right? Mm -hmm. Or the owner lived to be 105, <laughs> right? Because they could live there as long as they're alive and not have a payment, okay? But interest is accruing on the balance that is on that mortgage. So okay. it compounds and, and increases that balance that to do. So let's just say it's now upside down. That's where the FHA insurance, because these are FHA mortgages um, backed by the government, um, that's where the FHA insurance comes into place. That covers that gap so the heirs are never responsible for it. They simply walk, they have the option to walk away. Hmm, that's interesting. When I say option, <laughs> the other option actually is kind of cool. They give family members the opportunity to purchase the property at 95% of value. Oh. Regardless if it's upside down or not, that's always an option. So if it's worth 100000 you can buy it for ninety five. That is correct. Not that there's too many $100,000 homes. No, no, no. But it, it is, I mean, it's a nice option. Let's say there's some sentimental value to that property and there's someone in the family that doesn't want to let it go. I mean, you're getting it at a discount, whether it, there's equity in it or not. That is cool. That yeah. is really neat to know. And I'm wondering, of the question that comes to mind, there's a gal that I've met through my mom and the community that she lives in. Her mom was in the assisted living portion of the community, had a stroke which caused frontal, tempor uh, frontal temporal dementia. It's easy for me to say today. <laughs> and they had to put her in the memory community, which is more money. Not a lot more, but it is. So they sold her house. I think she said they had to sell it because they had the reverse mortgage. And I'm like... It's because she's no longer in oh, the home. Oh, she's not in it. That's right. So a reverse mortgage works great for a family that doesn't want to place their their parent or their family member in a home. They're able to use that equity line that's available and in place to cover the cost of bringing in home care. Yeah, which is unfortunately more money. So in your first example, you said they had a mortgage of one fifty and the value was five. So they have three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in equity. Correct. Can now, they outlive that? They absolutely can. But that equity is not all usable. That's where that factor comes in. So they say, okay, they're X age today. They have $350,000 in equity. We need to set aside 150 of that for future in, um, interest that accrues because that's where they take that from. Okay. And that would leave a $200,000 line of credit for the family to use towards whatever that so is needed for care. So if they don't need a lot of care, it might make sense. But like for somebody, well, one, for my mom, because she's now not living in a home, it wouldn't have made sense. Because my dad had talked about it, and I was kind of surprised that when everything happened last year, John pulled up the records and they didn't have a reverse mortgage, which was like, whew, thank goodness. Because we've rented out her house. So between her social security, the rental income, and income from investments, we're able to keep her there. Keep her where she is. Yeah. But let's say they had taken out a reverse mortgage and there was a line of credit in place. You could have kept her in the home and used that line of credit to pay 
or if the time came where you felt, okay, she needs to be in a home, then yes, as her power of attorney, you could either refinance the house and put it in a regular mortgage so you could convert it to a rental, or you could have sold it, taken that equity, and, you know, set it aside to pay her coverage of her care. Because I always just, when I find out, you know, we were on vacation, and I come back, and it's like, whoa, there have been some changes here, and it's they're subtle. The first one I noticed was... There were, like, different towels the in the bathroom. My mom... It's While a, your mom was still in the home? Um, no, home. In, no, in where she's now. Oh, okay. Basically, the gal that... They have a, adjoining bedrooms that's Jack and Jill bathroom. Okay. And so I'm like... You know, it's, it was subtle differences, but what I found out was the gal that had lived next to her, her family ran out of money. So they Aww. had to move her home. And I think... It's such a... It's sad. It's awful because, now, fortunately for her family, she's pretty old, and she was, I mean, her mind was bad, but she was physically getting around pretty well on her walker, and she could communicate with you what she needed. You right. Know, she, if she had an accident, she could tell you that she needed to be changed. and So her care wouldn't be as horrible as there are other people in, in the community. It's just... And you know. you're saying in-home care is more expensive yes. if you bring someone into your home. If you do it through an agency, it is. It's wow. um, okay. like twenty-five dollars an hour. Okay. So my and that twenty-four hours a day. That yeah, I see. Yeah, we were paying like seven hundred dollars when my both my well, my dad was on hospice and they were taking care of both parents. It was twenty-eight hours, twenty-eight dollars a day. So it was like seven hundred dollars a day. Wow. And so it was like. 45% more than, than an in-home facility where you know she's being yeah. taken care of. And it's... Now, here's another thing, too. Certainly, let's say that there is a husband and a wife still alive, and they're both on that reverse mortgage, and one is fine and one is not. That line of credit on that reverse mortgage gives the person that's not ill the opportunity to stay in their home mm -hmm. without a mortgage payment and write checks to cover the care. Yeah, that would have been... Because that, as long as one individual is still in the home, that's fine. So that is another way to kind of look at it when you're looking at a, a, a husband-wife joint I think it's, ownership. Yeah, it's, I think it's really hard because people... I don't think they realize that there are a lot of options until... You're presented Scram with a problem. And you're scrambling yeah, to find out what they are. Well, or right. you're like, you know, holy Toledo, you know, this is not a good situation. Like, when we, when, after my dad died and we were packing up my mom's stuff to move her to the memory community, it dawned on me that I had no idea the last time her sheets were washed. At her house. Yeah. Because she was there by herself. Well, they had the caregivers, but they were... It got very complicated because they started with my mom and then they had both of them and then my dad was in the hospital for another week and so it was a challenge. But their focus was him because he was on hospice and obviously he needed more... At that time. Yeah, right. he needed more care, even though he fought with them about it. <laughs> my mom needed more, like, supervision. So, I mean, it never dawned on me to ask him if they were washing her sheets. They were washing his sheets. They were washing clothes. Right. So I assumed that, you know, they were, oh, when we pulled them off the bed, they weren't. So Aww. it was just like, and they may not have thought. And that's the furthest thing from your mind yeah. at that time. You know, and it's just, after he died, it was very obvious that she was worse off than we thought. And it was fortunate that I'd had a month, you know, a couple months to figure out what we were going to do with her. Because my dad assumed she'd move in with me, and before he died, I didn't even have a spare bedroom, so. Right. And at 50, there was no way in heck I was going to devote 24-7. You know, my grandmother lived to 91. My mom's wow. 75. I'm like, no, no, I'm not giving up the next 15 years of my life. Right. If I was 20 years older, that might be a different story. Right. But not at 50, so. And the community she's in is fantastic. She doesn't really participate in the activities, but. She's taking care yeah, of. Yeah, well, she's, she, I go, when I go visit her on Mondays after Rotary, she's there. Half the time, she's 
shooting, you know, she's just shooting the stuff with the other ladies. And well, one of these days, I'm going to sneak around and, and try to eavesdrop because I can't imagine what they're doing. Da- what they're doing. How about. often they ca- repeat the same story. It's got to. <laughs> it's got to be interesting, but it's it's difficult to to go in and realize, oh, they're sitting at the table in the dining room and not be spotted. So. Right. My whole thing is as far as the socialization yeah. that's important it is very important and the constant someone's there mm-hmm. if something is needed yeah yeah i mean it's it's so, a challenge because that's you know staffing's always an issue right but so i would say a reverse mortgage would be beneficial for one of two things if there was a person that was adamant about never being put in a home which they all are. <laughs> okay, but uh, you know what I mean? So that would be number one. But number two, it would really be great for um, a spouse situation where one is fine and does not want to have to leave their home yeah. or sell their home to afford the care for um, their spouse. Well, I can see it, too, for the families who aren't benefic- benef- lucky like me. Try to just use a different word since that's not coming out right. <laughs> you know, I I do freak out a little bit that you know it's like whenever the costs go up with mom, it's like oh my gosh, is she gonna have enough money to live the rest of her life where she's at, where she's comfortable, and all that good stuff. You know, my sister has school age kids; she's younger than I am by almost five years. So, you know, neither one of us is in a situation to cover it, or right. wanting to have her move in with us. Right. Um, but I could see how you could take a reverse mortgage and supplement family care with in-home care. You know, because like I said, twenty-four hours, twenty-four-seven is who is expensive. Right. But if you had somebody there during the day, somebody to give respite care to the spouse who's fine, so that they're not trapped in the house all the time. I can see that being quite beneficial. Yes. So So I I think a reverse mortgage is very individualized and and how it's going to best fit someone's needs um, or their anticipated needs. I've done reverse mortgages for couples that they're perfectly fine right now, but they're planning, you know, where one spouse is 89 and the other one's 79 and you know, he's planning ahead so she's not misplaced. Yeah. They had no issues making their mortgage. They had plenty of money with their pensions, but they wanted that set up so for the peace of mind. And it may never get used. Yeah. Right? That makes sense. It may never get used. So it's also a, a estate planning tool, so to speak, for some, for if sure. they have the, the right mind to think about it ahead of time. There's too, much, too many things to think about just to get old. Right? <laughs> and then like, how are you going to get out of bed? Yeah, for real. <laughs> Without cracking well, I, your knees. <laughs> I, uh, well, I just did, this is part three of a series on dealing with the family home because, you know, once my dad was gone and my mom was moved out, just, they'd been in their home almost 47 years, so it was like... And thank God it was paid off. Well, yeah, and they weren't for hoarders, but they just had so much stuff. Right. And it's, well, you accumulate, right? Everybody does. Mm-hmm. I, I found a statistic that says the average American home has over 300,000 items in it. Yeah, I almost fainted. Wow. <laughs> I know, that's what I thought, too. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wish I'd kind of done a rough count at my parents' house because <laughs> I'm kind of wondering where they fell on the average. You know, if that's the average. <laughs> Ooh, <whoa. laughs> but one of the things they talk about is, like, you know, making sure you have the proper furniture. I have a really tall bed. And when I broke my collarbone, I had to use a step stool to get in and out or of the bed. Or use one of the other bedroom Yeah, which beds. I didn't, didn't right. have a spare one at that time. But, yeah, it was like... That is true. You don't realize how, you know, it's like, oh, this is a great bed. It's comfy and it's it's lovely. But once you have a physical issue and right. getting in and out is difficult... You know, it all can change. You know, and I have creaky knees, so there's chairs where it's like, ugh. You know, they tell you to get chairs with armrests and no <laughs> wheels. For leverage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's it's beneficial. Right. And the wind's going to blow everything around now. It was not windy out here earlier. So is there any other advice on reverse mortgages? Like, when should somebody start considering it? You said that this one couple planned ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, it really is so specific as to each person's situation, how old they are, and how much equity. The younger you are, the more equity you need in the property if you are carrying a mortgage. If it's free and clear, then the line of credit that you could have put in place is going to be less at 62 than if you were at 72. Reverse mortgages are, uh, they use 99 as the average lifespan. So that's kind of their marker. Everyone's going to live to be 99. Yeah, which well, is, it's far above the actual average, but that's good planning. Well, for them, right? They want to protect themselves. Because well, yeah. if, if someone took out a reverse mortgage at 62 and they live to be 99, that's it's a long time. A lot over 30 years yeah. of interest compounding, right? That's a whole other mortgage. Now, if, if they own their home free and clear and all they're doing is setting a line of credit in place, there is no interest compounding because there's no balance. Right. Until they write that first check to them or request that first check to themselves, then the, the interest is only calculated on the balance that's carried. That makes sense. And the other cool thing is, too, someone that's younger and has the ability equity-wise to put that into place and when I say younger, at least 62. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's not younger than every. Me. Let's say there's a $200,000 line of credit, right? And they don't need it. It's just there. It actually grows in size by half a percentage every month. Oh, that's pretty good. Right? So we encourage people, if you don't need to use it, don't use it. Because the longer you have it, the greater that line that's going to be available. Hmm. See, I knew, I knew you were the right person to talk to. I oh, start looking you. at all these things, I'm like, okay, I don't understand why you can't use reverse mortgage here. And, da, da. Yeah. It just gets and, it, and it's so hard because people will call me and they'll ask, well, they're 62. Like, what can they, you know, well, no. It, or there's 50% equity in the house. Well, no, I need to know their age. Like, literally, yeah. and, and it's not even a factor that I would know here in my head. You have to plug in those three pertinent pieces of value what they do owe, if they owe anything, and their date of birth of the youngest. If there is a spouse, oh, okay. then it's always the youngest age that's used. Um, and then it spits it out. So, And it could be, you know, where you're 68 today, but in a month you're 69. Well, that's going to change it again, right? Because you're a year older. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. So it's, it's one of those things that is very homeowner-specific. So check into it before you think you might even need it. It's it's yeah, not a bad 62. idea. Right. Awesome. Right. Well, right. I appreciate the advice. Yes. No. Anytime. It's recording. <laughs> Pretty sure it was. How do you know? You just push both buttons and the red light flashes. Well, that's it for this week. I do apologize for the wind that picked up during... Mine and Cynthia's conversation, but what the heck. I look forward to talking to you next week. I hope this three-part series has been useful. We'll lighten it up a little bit next week with some memories with mom or perhaps a topic on how to kind of know what they're thinking. So stay tuned, and I will see you again next week.